Welcome to Rip It Up, Start Again, where we bring you real disruptors. So what are real disruptors? Real disruptors are some of the ins most insightful people that I have ever met. They have a combination, of course they're entrepreneurs, but they have a combination of understanding and seeing real needs, cutting through and creating enablement through technology. So we have three speakers today, and um, at our last episode, we had the running poll, the leader is still Citizen Me. So please go to the website, ripitup.co, vote for who is your favorite disruptor, and in six months' time, they'll be back here to chair. So Citizen Me are in the lead at the most moment, fo fo followed closely by Unfold UK. After they've shared their pitch with us today here, talking about how they ripped it up and started again, we'll have our panel, our Q&A panel, when I ask them some deeper questions about what problems they're solving. Please tweet us with any questions that you have, and we'll try and bring them into the panel later on. Without much further ado, I'd like to therefore thank you for watching, keep watching, spread the word, disruptors, please contact me. I think on the lower, on your screens, you'll see my email address <coughs> and uh, reach out to us and we'll include you in the show in the coming episodes. So our first speaker today is Devika. Devika, Devika. I'm so sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Devika is our first speaker, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Devika, I'm the founder of Vida. So my story was born out of a very personal situation of caring for my grandmother for 10 years. At the age of 10, my grandmother became very sick. She had her first stroke and she was diagnosed with early onset dementia. At this point, she moved into the house with me, my mum and my dad. It seemed like a given that we would just look after her and hopefully make sure that she could stay at home for as long as possible without the need to go into a care home. What transpired over those next 10 years left a huge mark on my life and the way that I perceived how people should be cared for, not only when they're getting older, but when they have a disability. So through those 10 years, we tried to look after her as much as possible. Obviously as a child of 10, 11, going through puberty, going to university, it was very difficult to see one of my role models deteriorate so rapidly. And then watching my mum and dad try to struggle with full-time jobs and be at home when she was having epileptic seizures, she was having fits, she was having a lack of understanding of anything around her. We did try to engage with care providers and social services. Unfortunately, we weren't allowed to get any funding towards her care. So we ended up going privately to pay for a care company to come to her. But there was no continuity in the carers that were coming. We had around 150 different carers turn up to our door over that 10 year period. And they were all very different people. Some of them cared. Some of them didn't. And often what happened was when the carer was present, I would have to come home from school to make sure the carer was doing their job. Kind of didn't make sense. What happened also was the lack of communication and transparency in the care that was being delivered. There was no technology. There was no communication between the carers and ourselves. My grandma was on a multiple different array of medication because she had epilepsy, schizophrenia and advanced dementia. And often her medication was causing to have severe side effects that meant that she would often end up hospitalized. But no one was tracking this. So two and a half years ago, when I had the opportunity to start Vida, I wanted to make sure that every person has the care they deserve and they're able to stay at home for as long as possible without having to go into a care home and to make sure that the families are supported as much as the person themselves. So how did we start? We launched a care agency. I wanted to live and breathe the problem about why care agencies struggle so much to provide the right carer to the right person and also scale their business. So we did that and I found there was multiple different problems. There was no technology to enable us as a care agency to scale with the demand that we were seeing. So there is a huge demand for care now. We have an aging population and we have a limited supply of carers who are able to work with these people. And secondly, the carers have no career progression. They're paid nothing. They do the most difficult job I have ever seen and I bear witness to this as I go out on the field on a daily basis. And so fundamentally what I wanted to do was I wanted to incentivize these carers and give them career progression. 
I wanted to give them the qualifications and the empowerment to be able to go and do one of the toughest jobs out there and be respected by the people that they're caring for. And the technology that we developed, well, after those two years, we actually managed to service over 200,000 hours of care. And what we found was our limiting factor was being able to scale with that demand. So the technology that we developed is a full end-to-end -end platform that us as a care provider, Vida, are able to monitor all the logistics of getting the right carer to the right place at the right time, including matching that carer with the qualifications and soft skills that that client needs. So therefore, those 200,000 hours of care can now double, they can triple because technology is doing the things that it needs to do whilst we can focus on the caring aspect. Our second phase is at-home monitoring. We want to use IoT devices to sit on our ecosystem, which is our platform, to enable at-home person-centered care. This is a more clinical approach to care, because essentially, by keeping these people at home for longer, they may get chronic diseases, in which case we need to keep them out of hospital. We can only do this by empowering the carers and the clients with the tools to be able to collect the right data. So two and a half years later, we have now raised over six million pounds. Uh, the money goes out the window really quickly as fast as it comes in, um, but we're scaling. And our plan is to basically do acquisitions of other agencies in the UK and globally. We're going to put our technology platform into those agencies and actually scale with the demand that we're seeing and provide outstanding care to everyone in the UK and abroad. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to welcome Emma. Hi, it's great to be here. <clears throat> My name's Emma and I'm from Deployed. And we are bringing transparency and efficiency to statements of work. So what is a statement of work? Well, it's the contract that defines and underpins the work to be delivered between a consulting firm and the company buying those services or an individual contractor and the firm still buying those services. Now, the problem with the statement of work is that it's still very much a manual process. It's undigitized and often these statements of work are not even defined until people are on site delivering the work. So you can see that there is a massive risk associated with this for the company engaging with these services. So we decided that we wanted to change this. So we have built a data-led platform and we look at both live and historical statements of work to create a blueprint for the project that you're about to roll out. Now this is able to Im improve product project satisfaction it reduces risk and it ultimately saves money. Because our mission is about being transparent, with using this data, we're able to empower the company to understand the work that's to be delivered. So I'll give you an example. Within 20% of our customers' statements of work that we see, actually 20% of these projects do not actually need to go ahead. So the company is wasting money. More often than not, it can be the project that was meant to be the precursor project to this. So we're able to create a linear approach to projects that should happen within the company. Now, what's interesting about this is that all companies within a similar industry are facing the same market forces. So they will inevitably, inevitably be rolling out the same projects. So we're able to lift the lid on jargon and cut through the ambiguity and bring transparency. We've been working with some incredible clients to date and they're already seeing savings between 11 and 16%. And this is just purely on creating the right blueprint for the project. When we start swapping out and changing supplier, we're able to see even greater savings. We've been awarded two Innovate UK grants to date. The first one was for research and design and making sure that we're creating a platform that is truly user-friendly. No drop-down boxes and it's, it's user-centered design. Our second Innovate UK was awarded for emerging and enabling technologies. And this is to support the technology and the data and that machine learning to bring together these insights. Um, I'm Emma Rees and I would welcome you all to have a look at our website. Um, I'm from Deployed, and I would now like to introduce Alexandra. Hey, 
Able app. Able app is the world's first decentralized or peer to peer skills sharing space app. It's a bit like Airbnb or e but the key features in the app are the volunteer as well as charge time for your skills. So you can share up to eight skills. So it's different to more traditional sites. In the app, the service provider, the service seeker can search through registered their So it doesn't matter if you're an aerobics instructor, a bartender, a barista, a chef, or a DJ, the, uh, the site will work for you. What problem is um, ABLE addressing? There's a big change in the workforce and the, the nature of the workforce as it stands. We have a, uh, by 2025, 75% of the workforce are gonna be millennials. This group works autonomously, independently, flexibly, and they tend to be multitask. The current, the current uh, recruitment platforms available aren't suitable to, for, the, uh, for the millennial market. On top of that, the nature of the way that we work is changing too. McKinsey estimate that by 2030, 50% of all the work Europeans will be doing will be gig work. That is paid by the task, tends to be short term and autonomous. Able App is a new tool that facilitates uh, that kind of labor work, that gig work. Uh, the app is in, available on iOS and Android and is, a, and is in the app stores now at uh, www.able.global. You can download it. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our speakers. Um, we are now having a short uh, recess. You will see the video, rip it up, start again, which I created, produced back with Asa Bailey, um, back when I started this in 2016, um, just with some words that showed what other people saw about rip it up, start again, what the altruistic movement was, and why we're trying to build this community of disruptors, and we'll be able to give it back. Thank you very much. I think we're tired of doing things that are unrewarding to the human. If there's a genuine problem and you provide a genuine solution, it doesn't require so much like driving it down people's throats, which requires capital for sales and marketing. It's just there's a problem and all of a sudden it's a solution and sales is just organic. Disruption really starts at the root way that we interact with something to make it easier, more efficient and more rewarding. What we're seeing here is it doesn't matter what category you're in the same problems are occurring or the same opportunities are occurring. Because big corporations are just stuck in their own ways doing things that the way that they've always done because no one's challenged that and all of a sudden we want to buy brands from uh, companies that we care about that are doing better for the world, that have a better social footprint, that have a better impact on the, on the way that we feel. So they will be called disruptive companies because they, they bother the big ones but I don't think they necessarily are disruptive in terms of their way of working on the day to day. Uh, they are basically trying to shape a new form of economy that just works for people. I think we're all looking for ways to minimize our noise so that the things that we do choose to engage with, we want them to be more meaningful. Every company has a story. Your brand is real from the inside out. If you get that very clear and you're very honest with your story, what happens is the development and the birth of that company evolves in a very real way. I think the Rip It Up community is united by a, a dissatisfaction with the status quo. People are tired of seeing that business is uh, something extractive and it doesn't create the value for people that uh, they expect. Just generally being unsatisfied with the status quo, thinking that there's got to be a better way, you know, um, I think that's what unites all of us.
Companies come to Rip It Up because they see that it's part of a whole community, a movement, where people have got this tension, if you like, of wanting to change, wanting to affect a change and to share that change. There's marketing, there's PR, there's engineers, there's biologists, there are video gamers, they are completely widespread and do so many different things. So, but all those skills become an asset pool to everyone that goes through that system. So it's sort of like you, get, you have a nice little resource that you can tap at any time and say, hey, I need this. And then hopefully that community can answer. And if that community can't, they have obviously their own communities that they can reach out to as well. I want people to come to me and say, I've got a business proposition and I want to share it on your stage. I want to be part of this movement, if you like. I want people to come to me and say, I'm not quite ready, but I get what you're doing. Can you help me? And I just love that, um, that sort of idea that things can be better, you know, fundamentally, whether it's the people who are talking on stage or the people in the audience, just, just generally being unsatisfied with the status quo, thinking that there's got to be a better way, you know. Um, I think that's what unites all of us. I want everybody, I want, you know, building civilizational wealth for me is the end goal, it's the big picture, it's the big, you know, can I achieve a little bit of that? I would love to, I would love to, I'm sure just little old me won't, but if I can start people, you know, an avalanche starts in a very small way. Hi, welcome back to Rip It Up, Start Again. So we have our speakers all together here in the panel, and um, I'm going to kick off with the most obvious question of all. What large problem are you solving? Now, who wants to kick off and answer that question? <laughs> go on, Emma. Go on, go on, Emma. <laughs> all right, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start this one. It's, um, we feel that the problem that we're solving is a lack of transparency within the industry of consulting. I think everyone um, that's either worked as a consultant or is engaged with a consulting firm, we engage external resources because we don't have the talent internally to roll out the project that we need. However, when we're sold these services, there's lots of jargon and buzzwords and acronyms that we just don't understand. And consultants aren't very forthcoming in talking about the work, actually what is the statement of the work to be done. Um, because it leads to larger revenues and bigger projects and scope creep um, and also to bear in mind that sometimes the client actually doesn't know what they need, they just know they have a problem. So we feel by using both historical and live data we're able to lift the lid mm -hmm. on the jargon and bring transparency to say actually what is that job that we're doing and what skills do we need to roll that job out and yeah. that project. Yeah. So do, do you actually, does this involve then you doing quite a lot of immersion, if you like, in, with your clients early, early, early days? Because we're a relatively new company, uh, we do have the platform and the data to back it up. We have found because it's a new way of working, mm. so we would essentially sit between the company wanting the work and the supplier delivering it. And we enable them to, ha to make better decisions based on the facts and the data, rather than a gut feel of, mm. oh, I feel like I'm paying too much. Mm. Actually, I can tell you you're paying too much because mm. I've analysed a thousand other projects that are just like right. yours. But is it self-serve? It will be, be self-serve. Yeah. So yes, to come back to your question, there has been in the beginning an element of us hand-holding the customer through, because it's a behavioural change as well. So we have to um, guide them through that process and empower yeah. them with the skills to make those decisions. Yeah. Eventually it will be self-serve. Okay, That's the goal. Cool. We'll get onto that later. But So Alexandra, tell me, what's the large problem? Um, it's a fundamentally different solution to the inefficiencies and ineffectiveness that sit within our labour market at the moment. The fact that the, the tools that are currently out there, whether it's notice boards or LinkedIn, they're not quite fit for purpose, particularly given, as I mentioned in the pitch, the changing mm -hmm. nature of the, the, the people in the workplace, the fact that so many of them are millennials now, for example, and the nature of the way we're interacting with organisations and work, the fact that so many more people are freelancing. Mm. So it's a, it's, ABLE is a new tool to try and help people, empower them to articulate, share their skills in a new and different way that's not linked in, for but example. Also, but also, I guess it's, it, it's really about the consumer, the, the, sorry, the, the experience. So we're now, we've transitioned online. Mm. So we walk past the notice board with our eyes on our phone, mm -hmm. not on the notice board, mm -hmm. right? So it's just a different way that we're actually interacting. So that's what you're really feeding to, isn't Absolutely. it? 
absolutely. Te like five years ago, the technology wasn't around to support this, for right. example. So it, it now, now is the time. The fact that we've moved, we're moving from a ca capitalist paradigm to a more co community collaborative consumption paradigm mm -hmm. makes, it, again, people are more open to be uh, looking in their neighbourhoods to be trading. Right, right. And, and how open are you for other people to actually connect API-wise into your platform? And that's, that's the intention. There's a right. lot of great tools out there to support the gig workers, freelancers mm -hmm. and, the, and, um, and the changing labour market. So the intention is absolutely to be... Um, right, so that's more on the change in the future. We'll come yeah, back to that. Thank you. Me. Devika. 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 I will get there eventually. Eventually. Fine. I don't need a name. I'm just feed it now. I'll be able to know you by. <laughs> um, so our big problem is obviously the elderly population. So it's a huge ageing population around the world. There's not enough carers to look after them. Um, and the care homes are all closing down because they don't make money. But they're also awful institutes that people go to essentially pass away. Um, there are some amazing ones out there, but um, if you want to have a good one, you've got to pay around two to three thousand pounds a week to stay in a good care home. The rest of them are between maybe 400 to 500 pounds, and for that, it is horrendous. Um, so fundamentally, I want to make sure that everyone is able to stay at home for as long as possible. Um, there is this whole moral and ethical dilemma about uh, people, family members wanted to sell their loved ones homes to get the money and then they shove their loved ones into care homes, which I see a lot of when I go out to meet my but clients. Isn't that they sell the homes to afford the care? No. Oh. Mm -mm. Oh. <laughs> no. This is like the reality of the situation and it shocks me because obviously me and my family, we, we wouldn't have thought of any other way rather than just keeping her at home. Yeah. But a lot of families don't seem to care. Um, and I think that we need to change that mindset. And what I'm trying to do is make sure that there is other options out there so yeah. people can't just sell yeah. people's homes, yeah. put them into care homes. It's really interesting. It's kind of like you're the Airbnb of hotels, basically, aren't you? Because... Um, you know, in, in my experience of home is I gave birth to both children at home because mm. I refused to go to hospital because I'm not ill. I'm just mm. giving birth. Mm. Right. And I'd rather give birth in my environment with my own dirt and everything that's normal to me, because actually my my own immune system understands it mm. and it's, it's very comprehensive for mm. it. So in the same thing, when I get old, it's the immune system that's lacking. It's same, mm. you know, old people and babies are in the same sort of situation, vulnerabilities. Yeah. So, so actually, they should stay in their homes, yeah. right? Yeah. Because as you lose your senses, as you start to deteriorate and toward death, I guess, um, the best place to be is in your home. Because as mm. soon as you go to an environment you're not familiar with, the fear will come across and, and won't help with everything else that you need to survive, right? Mm. And also, if you're putting people, you know, have advanced stage dementia into a whole new environment in their last living years, of course they're going to deteriorate rapidly yeah. because their brain can't function and understand the change in the surroundings. It's just Absolutely. an unnatural situation to do. You wouldn't put your child at the age of three months into a nursery. They don't understand with no one around them. No, exactly. So it's That's the same with elderly people. So it's, 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 disru it's disrupting it to, to bring people, to basically you're disrupting the entire care system mm. to bring it back to home, mm. which is really, really nice. Um, so... <sighs> Actually, I'm going to stay with you on this question. What does trust have to do with the solution? Trust. God. Uh, <laughs> I mean, everything. So notoriously, the care industry has such a bad reputation. Um, and it's very, it has been very difficult to break into it and make people trust that our solution is the right solution to solving the care industry. How but, do you prove that? I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? It's about reputation. It's about going out there. It's about making sure that I spend one-on-one -on -one time with all of my clients, which I have done since the beginning. Um, but that's not scalable, and that's what I started to find. So then it's about myself replicating what I believe I should be doing with my clients. And obviously, it comes from a very passionate place um, to make sure that all of my employees who work for Vida emulate the exact same um, representation when they go out. Um, so it's just about ensuring that your values and the vision and your mission is so embedded into what you want to do mm -hmm. and that your clients feel that. And then um, once that happens, it's word of mouth and your trust, the trust in your solution becomes apparent. Um, but you're always going to come up against people in private or, or public services, sorry, social services, who don't believe that tech is the solution to this and that you can't pay a carer really well and charge a client less than what they've been charging because apparently it's not scalable. And I'm like, it is because tech enables you to scale in such an efficient manner. We'll get manner. on to scale yeah. later. Talk to me about trust in, in your area because, that, again, you're, you're changing mind shifts mm. because you're actually almost, um, obviously, if I'm wrong, please say, but you're almost telling people that the way you've approached this is incorrect and you actually really need to change the brief itself. Yeah. Yeah. 
I absolutely and and trust is as paramount of what we're trying to do and when we were doing our research um, we found that people would use uh, familiarity they would want to use the uh, consultant that they had before and they trusted them to do it I mean there's a famous saying no one was ever fired for hiring IBM and that was because they would feel that actually well they have all the answers and they mm. will deliver and we're definitely not saying that they don't deliver and there's faults on both sides of the equation. The customer doesn't know what they want, so there's ambiguity in mm -hmm. the consultant delivering and pitching for the right piece of work. But we feel that the data that we provide brings that trust. These people right. are very much convinced by data mm -hmm. rather than a gut feel. Right. But it is also reputation mm -hmm. um, from both sides. And we're finding that even consulting firms are interested in the data that we're gathering because they themselves don't gather the data to rewrite. They're, they're reinventing the wheel every time they're writing a statement of work. Interesting. So the, so the very people that you were sort of enabling to do mm. in a different way, i.e. almost looking as the enemy, yep. yeah, are now becoming part of the team. Yes, absolutely. And mm. for the people, um, if we take the firm out of the equation and look at the people, and it, it comes back to what Alexandra was talking about as well with, actually there's a, there's a rise of independent consultants and contractors out there on the market. I mean, PwC mm. suggests that 50% of people's workforces will be engaged on a flexible way. Mm. So we're just talking about gig workers at the, at the, the opposite mm. end of the spectrum. Mm. Mm. But actually they're more empowered to deliver their work if they know what's required of exactly. them. Yeah, so it, it works through. both ways. It's, mm. yeah, but I've trust heard actually the percentage, the growth of consultancy is 65% year on year. Yeah. It's Phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, it kind of goes hand in hand with, with, I guess, um, uh, gosh, um, entrepreneurs. Mm. Yeah. You know, entrepreneurs. Technology is allowing entrepreneurs to actually be entrepreneurial in a much, mm. much easier way. Mm. Right. It's all very lucid now. Yeah. So trust. How important is uh, in uh, trust for you for your solution? Um, it's a huge part of the solution, given that uh, it's a. It's a community trading app, essentially, a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized trading app. So we're inviting people to, to make those... I'm, I'm inviting people to make the connections. They have to have the responsibility of managing the trade themselves. Mm -hmm. um, in Able, you agree to uh, user values of being good, being fair, and being kind. And those values are built out for both the service provider and the service seekers to kind of explain what those look like. Um, in the future, I'd, um, looking at having um, maybe even cryptographic-based validation tools in there. To, the, to your point, APIs, mm -hmm. um, which can help actually validate that the person is that they say they are, yes. um, the, the experience that they have, for example. But mm -hmm. ABLE is a tool that I'm trying to help people um, create, to have that relationship necessarily without the technology. Yeah. So you can match them and then support them with the trade, mm -hmm. but ultimately mm -hmm. the success of it is up to them. Okay, so compliance comes at a later stage, really. Yeah, I mean, and it's also how 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 far along the supply chain is Able going to go? Mm -hmm. I, that that's not clear yet at the moment. Just trying to create these this marketplace, this matching marketplace. It's interesting, actually. Chain. It makes it makes me think of going back the generations and generations where you were a trader of a certain thing. You came together at a certain place, mm -hmm. and you all traded each other. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's very that's mm -hmm. very old. But actually, it's, it's kind of the new way of doing exactly that, isn't it? And what will happen with this, I, I'm sure, is, is people will start just doing less brilliantly rather yeah. than, you know, I can do everything. I'll, you know, yeah. I'll actually be doing exactly what I do brilliantly, what I really enjoy doing brilliantly, and mm -hmm. hence there'll be a less stress level for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that would be a nice thought anyway, wouldn't it? Thank you. Um, so uh, there we go. I've lost my battery, of course, as that happens. Um, so question number three. Yeah, oh, that this is a good one. So how do, how did you validate your idea? I mean, that's a really straightforward one. Let's start with Emma. <laughs> that's really straightforward on, on your pitch, I think. Family first. from the age of ten as well. Yeah, no, at ten I just validated my idea. That was a yeah. child genius. I'm not by any stretch. <laughs> Are you incredibly stubborn? You just like this is what I'm going to do. No. No, oh. no, no, I'm the opposite. I just flitted all over the place. Like, I never w went in to do a business. I still right. don't even know how to run a business. That's so, no. That I is don't, no, no. so not true. No, no, no. <laughs> it is, uh, fundamentally, running a business is, it takes a lot of people management, a lot of, like, HR skills, a lot of, ten like, tenacity that I never thought I had. And I don't have people management skills. I'm a scientist by background. So, no. I didn't always want to go into business. I didn't know how to start a business. So, no, none of that. I just knew that I wanted to solve a problem. And then by chance, I was like, do you know what? I know I can do this. And I didn't understand about investment or raising investments. So no, complete opposite. Can you share some of those struggles just for our audience? Because they'd be fascinated by that. What, the struggles of being 
me. <laughs> this is not a couch, okay? This is a seat. But no, no, I really mean in the, in the context of, you know, if, if you imagine, you know, we're, we're building this you know, world of disruptors and I'm trying to elevate disruptors into a sort of, it's like a hive of disruptors yeah. because I feel, the, I feel that disruptors have always been quite isolated. And I, again, I don't want to get into the couch situation, but because they've got this, this energy, high energy and the visionary, you know, th this ability to see things that mm. other people don't see in a very different way, not to say right or wrong, it's just very different. You do find that you surround yourself in, in not like people, right? Mm. And so, that, you know, you're, all your really close friends as you're growing up have very different skill sets mm. to you. And, you know, you're always the kind of one that's slightly batty, potentially, in a good way, mm. in a very good way. Mm. And I get that sense with, with all the disruptors I've ever met. You know, they're just like, hang on a minute. Just because that's the way it's always been done, why? Mm. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people don't stop to do that. They don't, they don't ask that question. Yeah. So you are different. That. Yeah, 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 it's really is. You I'm are different. I am. <laughs> but it's, it's also having, and I say stubborn, I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean in a, in a way that convict... You, you were convicted of your idea and you stuck with it. Yeah, I think against that's the important the part. Odds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's against the odds, isn't it? Because you go Absolutely. into this and you're like, I, you know, I had no idea about what a cap table was. I didn't understand investment. I didn't understand Series A, all these, all these words, all this jargon. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know what an angel investor was. I didn't know what a pitch deck was. Like, all of it was completely alien to me. Yeah. Um, and I think that just, I think when you, when you go through so much just because you're so believing in this idea that you have that it's going to change the world somehow but it's so alien to you it's I think that's the bit that I'm most proud of what I've done but mm. some of the things that I've gone through you know is like is um being completely like screwed over because I don't understand the jargon and so people were just like oh okay hold on a second she doesn't know that like that equity will give that dilution and therefore <laughs> Let's just write that term sheet. Um, and then me being really naive and people and thinking that people are really great and they're mm. not going to screw you over. Mm. And then mm. they do. Yeah. Um, so I've had some of those. And then obviously um, mis un misunderstanding kind of your cash burn and like how much you're spending and then raising not enough money and then almost going into liquidation. Um, that is the trials and tribulations of being a founder. Yeah. Um, but getting through those humps um, is what makes the ride so exhilarating. Right, mm -hmm. almost having nervous breakdowns every other week is fine um, if you don't mind going grey prematurely. But yeah. if you do, yeah. don't be a founder. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna say. But to, just coming back to the, the, the validation of the idea, did you need anything beyond your gut to validate that idea in your situation? Um, yeah, well, yeah, you need the investors to validate it, right? Because you can, you can believe so, so aggressively in what you're doing and you're like, this is going to change the world and investors will turn around and knock you back. Mm. You, you're, you're not going to pitch to every investor and they're going to be like, this is a great idea. You're going to pitch to over 300 investors and five will believe in your initial idea. Mm. And then it's just about executing. Once mm. they've believed in you, you have to execute. So it's just never ending. Mm. Um, but thankfully for me, this is an industry that's completely untapped. Every single investor that I met and every person I meet has been through it in some way, whether they have Family had their members. loved ones or they've got like people that they know people. And so it wasn't difficult for them to validate the idea. It right. was just about, is this industry going to accept the disruption? Okay. So okay. That, was the, that was the problem. We still yeah. find that every day now. Yeah, of course. Mm. Of course, we're still early doors in that, I think, yep. across all sectors. Yep. Validation. Yes, it's a great one. We we got really lucky. Well, I say lucky. Um, we worked really hard at it. We Our first Innovate UK government grant that we were awarded mm -hmm. was for early stage design and research foundations. Right. So actually we spent over 350 hours with structured interviews, understanding the way that the current system works and interviewing both buyers and sellers. Um, it actually helped us uh, refine our offering and what we were going to take to market. Right. Um, and then really early on, we were able to take our first client on board um, and that also helped validate. But I also think as well, you can never assume product markets fit with technology just because you get one customer, mm. particularly with B2B. I think you can't have any ego. You really need to strip that back and go, actually, if I'm really truly trying to solve this problem and my market is asking for something different, are we able to, to move slightly with to what the customer needs? Mm. Well, we're going to come on to change later. So what about, what about you, Alexandra? Um, validation what did you so able as as a as a as an idea um 
comes from a kind of a decade of my career. So like that's that was what it was born out of. Throughout the build and design process was user testing it with um, communities of people that um, will be the users and have downloaded it since. Um, full uh, validation is going on now. I've got three boroughs that I'm currently rolling out to. Um, two in London, Newham and Lambeth and Rygate and Banstead in Surrey. Um, where in each of the <coughs> areas we're ta um, partnering with a community project, the biggest one being Brixton Pound in Brixton, um, higher education institutes, co-working sites and local business networks, as well as um, communications, <coughs> PR marketing to get to um, kind of the commons. But uh, yeah, on each site taking those, um, those four hours and, and rolling it out there. And we've just started and feedback's going really well. So, Was it really tough to... Um Enter. I mean, the, the, basically, you were using the government um, offices mm -hmm. to resell your yeah. concepts. I mean, it's one of. I mean, in my experience, it's the hardest. I've got way. so much support so far, really? particularly, particularly from the voluntary sector groups that I come across because they okay. love it because you can volunteer enable. It's just yeah. about you as a person and what skills you can bring, whether mm. you want to charge for them mm -hmm. or whether you want to volunteer them. Um, and higher education institutes love it as well because you've got, you know, high, uh, either part time students or 16 to 18 year olds who have skills mm -hmm. and that they, they're mm -hmm. looking for ways to articulate and share them. And the CV format isn't working. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm quite enjoying it. Yeah. I, and I get on with I can. In the, oh, I'm part of the London Mayor's Business Growth Development Programme. So I think that helps. Right. Can, I can that get into accounts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, how, how does your app make money? Sorry. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> as a marketplace and as, a, as an app like this, it's only going to um, be valuable at scale, really. Yeah. Um, so that's where I am now. I'm, I'm scaling it to see. Mm. Uh, but you, presumably you take a cut of every... I, there's no transaction support. Oh, no, 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 it's a free app. It's built like it, the, the, the routes to revenue will be um, improve the um, functionality on offer, put in calendar, put in some kind of even minor statement, like helping people mm. like structure and contract yeah. their roles, perhaps, um, and charge like subscription fees. So just have oh, like okay. a premium service for a better product. Um, put advertising in is, a, is another option. People have begun to say that if it was a like if they were getting more work from it, that they would pay 50p or a pound yeah. to download it. Mm -hmm. Um, I work part time for a um, Ethereum based uh, like blockchain company, and I've had people approach me about you know once there's once there's much more trade happening in the app than, than the idea of having a, uh, a cryptocurrency or a, a token. Mm -hmm. This is not something that I would do at this stage whatsoever, especially mm. because I'm working with higher education institutes and the go yeah. like government, what have you. Yeah. But in the future, who knows? Mm. So there are routes, but I don't have it yet. I don't mm. know. Well, that that actually segues really well to the next question, which is how are you going to scale your business? Mm -hmm. Oh, so yeah. Create the assuming these three, or however well these three um, um, validations. So these are your business cases. Yeah, however well they work, I create a repeatable method, and right. either I either I scale the company, I raise, um, or I get grants because of the nature of the work that I'm doing, and I can mm -hmm. scale it quickly across the UK. I can even try and create a franchise type thing and push mm -hmm. it out. I've had mm -hmm. people contact me when I was doing more pushing it out on social media more. I've had people be like, can you come to Amsterdam and roll this out here? Can you come to Valencia? We really need this. Mm. So I do see an opportunity to create like packs and then activate right. without me even being there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, focusing on, on these, um, these, these business cases right now and then we'll see with the scale. Right, but yeah, you need there. to start drilling those, that income in, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So how are you going to scale your business? Um, Self-serve. So yeah, self-serve to move into more automation and actually the the wider data set that we get. So at the moment we um, focus on travel and leisure and financial services because mm -hmm. it's where we have the most data because okay. that's when the blueprint becomes relevant. Right. Um, but it's taking data from different areas. So the more data we have, the more relevance we can provide to the customers. Right. Interesting. You should probably plug into Sisters and Me. Yeah. Because they have huge data, depths of data, because they, they have open APIs. Oh, yeah, you had mentioned that before. Yeah. OK, we, yeah. we should pick up on that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, scale. Uh, so our scale is coming through. Well, we have quite a tricky model. So we have huge demand, which is a known thing around the world, and our supply is weak. So obviously we are trying to make sure that we attract more carers into the industry, professionalise it, so people actually want to go into it and they've got career progression, just like you would if you were a nurse or a doctor, you'd work your way up mm -hmm. and have certain skill mm -hmm. sets. Um, so that's a huge education. Yeah, isn't it? a because huge part to it, yeah. People fall into mm. care, right? Yeah, people fall into it because it's, 
deregulated. Um, it's easy money, easy money, but no money. This is what the, it was the, the industry belief. Um, and you can work on your own time and you can often evade a lot of things. So essentially you can go to a house, be there for 20 minutes and get paid for an hour because no one was monitoring it. So that's where the technology comes in. So now with our app, they have to check in and check out um, and they can't check in unless they are within certain meters of the house. So it means that we are bringing another level of regulation to what the carers can and can't do. But actually what it's, what it's doing is professionalizing the industry. So we're getting yeah. rid of all of these yeah. bad names about what carers are and do because it, there are fundamentally amazing people out there and the really bad ones put a really awful image on the people that are doing a great job and it drives me mad. Mm. So my idea was technology should bring transparency to the whole um, model of delivering care. The transparency enables you to then scale because you don't have to do so much admin and paperwork and governance and following people because you know you have mm. to look at care plans which are all paper based in people's homes and that takes a lot of resource and volume mm. to get to those homes. Mm. Um, and the other side is obviously having to match the demand with supply it can be very tricky because we can get over 90 inquiries for care a week if we wanted to, if we put money into our AdWords and marketed our services. Mm -hmm. But then we wouldn't have the right supply of carers in the right place with the right skill sets mm -hmm. to match with those mm -hmm. clients. So it's a very, very tricky play that we have to get right. And that's mm -hmm. where our tech matching platform comes into play because you can kind of essentially automate that process. Mm -hmm. And then all of the caring becomes more personalized because mm -hmm. you can put your, your resources as a care provider to the right place. Um, so it's scaling, we're gonna basically acquire agencies and plug in our tech. It's interesting because I, I kind of, I'm thinking, how are you going to make caring more sexy? Sexy. Because if you made it more sexy using tech, right? No, bear with me on this one. If you made it more sexy <laughs> using tech, um, as in, you know, I get drone deliveries or I, you know, yeah. I somehow, I'm in charge of, I'm the carer, right? Mm. I'm in charge of, but my James Bond equipment, right, is so fucking cool. Mm. I'm on it because actually I'm a really nice person. I like looking after mm. people. But if I haven't got a use for gadgets, I'm not going to go with it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So if... A transit, like you're talking about, the education of the actual job itself. Mm. You know, if that comes with, you know, tech that enables me to do my job far better, more efficiently, um, you know, so we actually what we need to do is attract people that are very innovative mm. that can actually come into this sector, and then suddenly you'll get a whole fresh type of people. Yeah doing this because we have to kind of get rid of that stale wood mm. that are taking the piss, taking advantage, yeah. uneducated mm. um, and not doing what their job is, you yeah. know, yeah, which yeah. is crazy because yeah. this, is, this is where you've come from, right? Yeah. We essentially like I, I see it's kind of doing the opposite of what Uber's done for taxi drivers. Yeah. So the black cabs were they're qualified. They go through an intense test to do what they do, and they know the roads at the back of their hand. And it was kind of a very specific job that you got into. Yeah, Uber created the volume and scale to the taxi driver and took away mm. the regulations and qualifications required to be a taxi driver, right? Using technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're doing the opposite, but essentially what we want to do is make sure that we attract the right carers in and that they are given the tools to enable care that's being being delivered to be better mm. because if you give them diabetes monitoring toolkits or COPD and they know how to use it then the data they give us is so much more effective yeah. and then they become the the pathway to the nurses and doctors in the hospitals mm -hmm. to enable that full end-to-end -end, like person-centered package mm -hmm. to be perfected yeah brilliant mm. brilliant Brilliant. And then also you'll have open APIs to research companies yep, like this exactly. and me that can find out yep. what's going on. Yeah. Um, absolutely genius. And the loop will start to, to close, yeah. as it were. Um, so we're, we're running out of time. So the last question is uh, about change. So what changes are you investing in um, for your immediate future or longer term? I mean, we, we can talk about real visionary stuff if you want, but it's, it's kind of up to you how you, how you discuss it, Alexandra. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm the change that I see, I see, the change that is coming, that is really shaping ABLE is there's more and more people. Um, there's a Japanese concept called Ikigai, which is where you find that thing that you do that's your sole purpose that the world needs and that you can get paid for. So what are those things that you want to do naturally as opposed to going to an office? So more and more people are deciding to follow their sole purpose yep. and not st stick around doing careers they don't want to do anymore. So that's going to be seeing more people come to tools like Able. On top of that, the change that's coming in terms of moving towards more collaborative um, economies, mm -hmm. um, again, is going to be driving more people towards Able. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, th I think it's going to be a natural, massive transgression of, of because of the 65%. It's the same kind of thing, isn't it? 
increase on consultancy. All it means really is that people are becoming entrepreneurs. They're stepping out of the grid. They're, mm -hmm. They are breaking their own status quos mm -hmm. and they're going, yes, I can do this job, but I'm not enjoying it at all. Mm -hmm. And they now know that that's going to lead me to an early death. Mm -hmm. So they're going, I need to take hold of what I love doing and I'm going to yeah. do it. And so you're enabling that. Yeah, do what yeah. you love. That's one of the expressions. Yeah. That's how I try and when I'm, when I'm, I'm talking to the, I'm getting new, new users on board. That's mm. what we start to talk about mm. because that's what the most important thing is. And there's too many mm. people out there that are going into work and they're not happy. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, that's great. Change. Change well, investment I, in change. Yes, I our mission is that we um, are changing the way that companies engage with external resources. Right. Um, I believe that our platform will become the infrastructure of the future, and mm -hmm. as we discussed earlier, if that independent work and gig workers, even at the other end of the spectrum, are on the rise, actually, if we could facilitate those people mm -hmm. going into companies to deliver that work. Um, mm -hmm. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Actually, we're, we're kicking off a project with Warwick University and the Office of National Statistics because this body of workers are defined differently from company to company. So we're mm -hmm. trying to change and get involved with some government policy because the people that the contingent workers don't have to report them, mm -hmm. they don't report the pay gaps, the gender pay gap, because they can't be classified. They're all classified right. as something different. So actually that's a side project that we're really passionate about, is defining these individuals so then they can move freely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Boxes, hey? Yes. <laughs> Boxes. I've never fitted in a box. <laughs> 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 um, I think for me, I mean, obviously, I've spoken to some blue and face about Vida, how we're changing that, but um, so I think that's a given. But for me personally, what I'm really inspired to do, and I think Emma em agrees with me because we try to do this together, is inspire the way that people perceive female founders, yeah. women in business, young women who have to be the stereotypical person or you don't believe in yourself or you're not told that you can be a business leader or a female founder or run a business. Um, I think it's really important as a role model that I inspire those women to be able to do what they want to do mm. from a young age mm. and jump through those milestones, jump through those hoops, jump through those really awful barriers to you succeeding. That's what I'm really inspired to change. And I think mm. Vida has been a platform not only for myself to, to like inspire myself. I didn't know I could do any of what I've been doing, um, but also change people's lives like physically with carers and clients. But then, yeah, inspiring young women um, that they can be the change they want to see in the world. And that's what I live mm. by. And that's mm. what I've loved my journey for. Mm. And I'll continue to do even when Vida's gone. That's really, yeah, that's yeah. really interesting because mm. I came, I'll just do a quick plug because you've, you've, you've introduced it beautifully. But um, uh, Angel, uh, Angel Investors, the mm. Angel Academy yeah. mm -hmm. is just for women. Yeah. Um, because what they and 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 basically the the guy the person that started it up I, I I don't know who she is actually Sarah Turner Sarah Turner yeah. that's it Sarah Turner was like you know what in the investment level the questions that are asked of females versus males mm. completely different mm. yeah so I've often been asked why are you capable of doing this yet my co-founder has never been asked that question when we pitch for investment it's what's the growth plan yeah. You know, or how are you capable yeah. of it? Yeah. Anyway, so let's not even get on no, that topic. No, we cannot. We cannot today because it's very unusual. Love I've never, that topic. I've never actually had a panel of women, like all of us right, being women. females. This Yay. is the first time ever. So, go girls. This is really interesting. Thank you Where so much. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time this morning on Rip It Up Start Again. Really enjoyed the discussion, and um, good luck for your growth plans. And um, please keep watching everybody and sharing. And please um, email me any disruptors that obviously I, there's loads of you out there that I don't know. So please contact me um, for future shows. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.